Many people do not understand Big Cat Anatomy, so today I'm gonna clear everything up. To put it simply, the lion is not a more robust cat, whatever the difference may be in terms of quantity, this is simply not how it is. The first thing that I want to talk about is the relationship between agility and physical power in felids. There is a general belief that the two really cannot go hand in hand, and this belief is often accompanied by the argument that if a tiger is more agile, then it is physically weaker compared to a lion, which isn't really true. A cat can evolve more powerful triceps for example because it may be a relatively saltatorial slash arboreal animal, one that jumps or lives in trees frequently, which would require a more powerful extension of the forearm, which is what the tricep does, extending the forearm. This fact is even mentioned in Valkenburg's study with the brachial index, the forelimb prey size indicators in the felidae. Quoting the study, arboreal felids have shorter radii relative to humeri, and therefore a smaller brachial index, BI, because shortened distal limbs increase the mechanical advantage of forelimb flexors and extensors, allowing arboreal species to climb more effectively. So, indeed, there is absolutely no reason why a tiger can't be more agile and more powerful at once, as the low brachial index is also a feature of big game predators. A possible explanation for why a tiger seems to be faster in combat is how the muscles work. The Bengal tiger has a smaller brachial index, or, a comparatively short radius, which as stated previously increases the mechanical advantage, or moment arm of the forelimb muscles, but, what exactly does that mean? A higher moment arm means that the muscle can generally produce more torque, torque being the power that causes an object to acquire angular acceleration, meaning that a higher torque should also somewhat imply a higher angular acceleration. This superior torque is achieved by the tiger's greater radial and humeral curvature, as well as the brachial index that I mentioned, meaning that the forelimb might be able to achieve higher angular accelerations. Here's a comparison of the attachment of the teres major muscle. As you can see, lions have the largest teres major, but, the mechanical advantage of the muscle lacks. The out lever is much greater than the in lever, meaning that the muscle needs to produce greater force through the in-lever to produce the necessary torque to move a load. I'm not saying that either really edges here though. Additionally, tigers have proportionally larger deltopectoral ridges, meaning that the attachment for the pectoral and deltoid muscles is larger, but, keep in mind their humeri are in absolute terms longer, so the difference is bigger. The deltoid musculature is part of the shoulders and plays a part in moving the forelimb, the same goes for the pectoral muscles, which in humans is more commonly called the chest muscles. Indeed, even in cats the pectoral muscles are absolutely gigantic and are bigger in tigers. These muscles were in fact relatively larger in the tiger compared to any cat in the study. So, you can say the tiger has the most robust or muscle chest in felids. The humeri in tigers have a higher diameter in the mediolateral plane, higher cross-sectional area, more curved, and overall are more robust. In general, the chest is bigger in tigers, and their upper body is overall thicker and more robust in appearance, while lions are typically thicker and more robust at the rear. Link to charts for chest girths will be in the description. When using tigers and lions above 4 years old, the tigers typically had chests that were about 10 to 12 centimeters larger in girth. Of course, the lion also has its advantages. The presacral vertebral column consists of three types of vertebrae, the cervical, the thoracic, and the lumbar vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae are what makes up your neck, and the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae are what make up your back. A general rule is that relatively short thoracic and lumbar vertebrae is advantageous for bringing down large prey, or chasing them down for extended periods of time. What a shorter back does, is it provides more stability to the animal, makes the contraction of the latissimus dorsi more effective, as well as with the pull of large muscle masses of the back. Lions do hold the shortest backs out of most panthera, including tigers, jaguars, leopards, etc. 
One reason the lion might have evolved this way is because it probably has the greatest stamina out of all of the panthera, being one of the few cats known to chase their prey after long distances, and this shorter back does provide a stamina advantage specifically when running. I don't fully believe that the tiger is just gonna sacrifice a strengthened back for quick accelerations which could be used for large prey capture just because its stamina isn't as good though, which I will get into in a bit, but in this sense, lions indeed have the stronger backs. In contrast, this might give the lion a more slender appearance in the bulk of its trunk, however. Lions also have a more robust atlas, and overall relatively thick neck compared to tigers. Though, it's pretty irrelevant in combat, so count it as an advantage with the lion, but not really a useful one. Lions have stronger biceps and hind limbs also, the biceps doesn't constitute the entire radial robustness, in which tigers do edge, but lions definitely have stronger hind limbs. The morphospace plot favors the lion over the tiger, showing it displays a greater positive number in the BBL, FMI, and BI parameters, but the BI is advantageous on the tiger given the fact lower scores are considered better in terms of robustness. Even though only one specimen for each species is used in the study, the morphospace plot already makes it conclusive enough. They not only play a central role in morphometrics but also underlie the notion of adaptative landscapes that drive theoretical considerations in evolutionary biology. Basically, the values given for the animals can be used as accurate comparisons since the morphospace plot compares their adaptative landscapes. So overall, we can conclude that the lion has stronger biceps, and necks, that is if you're being generous, as well as hind limbs. But the back? Not exactly. Like I mentioned before, I'm not of the opinion that a tiger's back is weaker, or less efficient in large prey capture just because it requires better acceleration. The tiger's more acute iliac angle reinforces the whole body stiffness, meaning that it is more difficult to overpower, and is capable of increasing the counterforce produced by a predator when hunting large prey. The sacroiliac joint is the center of transmission for the forces from the limb to the spine. So this doesn't mean the tiger is worse in pulling, or that it has a less stable body, no. It's not a small difference either, it's about 22%. There are other things I haven't stated but tigers have stronger upper bodies, while lions have stronger lower bodies. I'd consider tigers to be built better as the upper body is obviously, the most important part of a felid when fighting. Quantitatively, maybe they're equal, but qualitatively I favor the tiger. There is one part that I haven't talked about yet, that is, the skull and teeth. The tiger and lion's skulls are built differently and built for different purposes. The lion's skull is designed to resist stresses from large prey, while the tiger's skull is built for large jaw muscle attachments, to crush the trachea faster and in return, make a faster kill. The tiger's skull is relatively wider. The jaws are proportionally shorter, providing more leverage during a bite. The BFQ, also known as the bite force quotient, determines how powerful the bite of a species is relative to their body weight. The higher the number, the stronger the bite, pound for pound. In the study called Bite Club, comparative bite force in big biting mammals and the prediction of predatory behavior in fossil taxa, we can see that the tiger's bite force quotient is 127, compared to the lion's 112. In carnivores, the temporalis is the most important muscle for jaw closure. Even considerably smaller tiger skulls produce more force in this muscle than lions, and the mechanical advantage of it is greater. Lions are oriented more towards the masseter muscle, while the tiger has the stronger temporalis. Now, let's move on to the canines. A lot of people believe that lions have more robust canines, but I haven't really seen any basis for this claim. In fact, it's the complete opposite. In terms of both relative mediolateral and anteroposterior width of the canines compared to the length of canines, tigers edged. Dr. Per Christensen even refers to the tiger's canines looking quote-unquote sturdier in appearance, and also called them more robust. His numerous amounts of data showed that tigers had relatively stronger canines, and this also goes for Valkenburg.
Here are some visual comparisons of their canines. As you can see, the lion's canine is shaped like a banana, the tiger's canine looks more solid. The root, where the canines attach is much thicker in tigers, lions don't compare in this area, at all. This would reinforce Dr. Per Christensen's idea of tiger canines looking sturdier in their appearance. The tiger's molars and canines are sharper, and since tigers have stronger jaw muscles as we just discussed, the higher force and a smaller surface area at the tips of the canines and molars would also increase the pressure behind a bite. All in all, lion skulls are designed to resist stresses from holding prey, while tiger skulls and canines are designed to kill prey quickly. The inherent problem with the lion fan's definition of robustness is that they cherry-pick badly. When talking about the chest, they make baseless claims or they show a captive tiger compared to a wild muscled lion, and what they do is they show the breadth of the chest, forgetting that depth also exists. The record circumference of the chest belongs to a tiger. Bezonghat also known as T-46 post-mortem report. He had a chest of a whopping 188 cm in girth. You could argue he was bloated but that's a bit debatable only during the time of measure. No lion. I mean none has come close to this number even giving him an estimate of about 160 centimeters due to the once again ambiguous bloating. Circumference is not just the depth or the width, it accounts for all angles, and is thus a more accurate measure of bulk. Tigers have the greater chest girths on average as well. Links to charts for chest girths will be provided in the description of this video. The chest girth of 43 tigers from Kuch Behar averaged 130 cm, in comparison, the chest girth of 70 lions from Smuts et al. averaged 122.8 cm. The chart I will be including in the description has an even higher figure for tigers, that is, 136 cm. Even taking into account the debatably biggest lion population, the Ngorongoro crater lions, their chest girths average at only 130 cm. It can be seen that with the average Bengal tiger and the average southern African lion, the former takes the edge in terms of the bulk of the body. According to Sharani, tigers hold more bulk on their bodies relative to their limb lengths than even jaguars and lions, meaning the limbs have to bear more weight and bulk on them. Furthermore, here are some calculations done by a fellow poster on bestiary. This suggests that leopards, jaguars, and tigers have the densest bodies, at least compared to lions. Although I believe comparisons don't really matter if you're trying to make a generalization out of it, here are some comparisons to give you a general idea of what I think. Here are some neck girths of lions and tigers, credits to Dr. Chad Cocking for this valuable info. Note, plentiful of tigers here were younger than the lions. Tigers had a much much higher tendency to hit larger numbers, the largest neck girth out of all the 18 lions, was 81 centimeters. That's only the average tiger, which is absolutely insane. I hope you all learned something from this video of mine. I've put a lot of work into it so if you want me to drop out more content like this, then please subscribe, like, or share, that is what brings me motivation. I'll see you all in my next video.